Book 15, Chapter 6, The Antiquities of the Jews, Volume 3. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Peter. The Antiquities of the Jews, Volume 3, by Flavius Josephus. Translated by William Whiston, Book 15. Chapter 6, How Herod Slew Hyrcanus, and then hasted away to Caesar and obtained the kingdom from him also. And how a little time afterward he entertained Caesar in a most honorable manner. Herod's other affairs were now very prosperous, and he was not to be easily assaulted on any side, yet did there come upon him a danger that would hazard his entire dominions. After Antony had been beaten at the battle of Actium by Caesar, Octarian, for at that time both Herod's enemies and friends despaired of his affairs, for it was not probable that he would remain without punishment, who had showed so much friendship for Antony. So it happened that his friends despaired, and had no hopes for his escape. But for his enemies, they all outwardly appeared to be troubled at his case, but were privately very glad of it, as hoping to obtain a change for the better. As for Herod himself, he saw that there was no one of royal dignity left by Hyrcanus, and therefore he thought it would be for his advantage not to suffer him to be an obstacle in his way any longer, for that in case he himself survived and escaped the danger he was in, he thought it the safest way to put it out of the power of such a man to make an attempt against him. At such junctures of affairs, as was more worthy of the kingdom than himself, and in case he should be slain by Caesar, his envy prompted him to desire to slay him that would otherwise be king after him. While Herod had these things in his mind, there was a certain occasion afforded him, for Hyrcanus was of so mild a temper both then and at other times that he desired not to meddle with public affairs, nor to concern himself with innovations, but left all to fortune, and contented himself with what that afforded him. But Alexandra, his daughter, was a lover of strife, and was exceeding desirous of a change of the government, and spake to her father not to bear for ever Herod's injurious treatment of their family, but to anticipate their future hopes, as he safely might, and desired him to write about these matters to Malchus, who was then governor of Arabia, to receive them and to secure them from Herod, for that if they went away, and Herod's affairs proved to be as it was likely they would be by reason of Caesar's enmity to him. They should then be the only persons that could take the government, and this both on account of the royal family they were of, and on account of the good disposition of the multitude to them. While she used these persuasions, Hyrcanus put off her suit, but as she showed that she was a woman, and a contentious woman too, and would not desist either night or day, but would always be speaking to him about these matters, and about Herod's treacherous designs, she at last prevailed with them to entrust Dositheus, one of his friends, with a letter wherein his resolution was declared, and he desired the Arabian governor to send to him some horsemen who should receive him and conduct him to the Lake Ashphotites which is from the bounds of Jerusalem three hundred furlongs. And he did therefore trust Dositheus with this letter, because he was a careful attendant on him and on Alexandra, and had no small occasion to bear ill will to Herod, for he was a kinsman of one Joseph whom he had slain, and a brother of those that were formerly slain at Tyre by Antony. Yet could not these motives induce the Scythians to serve Hyrcanus in this affair for preferring the hopes he had from the present king to those he had from him. He gave Herod the letter. So he took his kindness in good part and bid him, besides do what he had already done, that is, go on in serving him, by rolling up the epistle and sealing it again and delivering it to Malchus and then to bring back his letter in answer to it. For it would be much better if he could know Malchus's intentions also. And as Scythius was very ready to serve him in this point also, the Arabian governor returned back for answer that he would receive Hyrcanus and all that should come with him, and even all the Jews that were of his party, 
that he would moreover send forces sufficient to secure them in their journey, and that he should be in no want of anything he should desire. Now as soon as Herod had received this letter, he immediately sent for Hyrcanus and questioned him about the league he had made with Malchus. And when he denied it, he showed his letter to the Sandringham, and put the man to death immediately. And this account we give the reader, as it is contained in the commemories of King Herod, but other historians do not agree with them, for they suppose that Herod did not find but rather make this an occasion for thus putting him to death, and thereby treacherously laying a snare for him. For thus do they write, that Herod and he were once at a treat, and that Herod, given no occasion to suspect that he was displeased at him, but put this question to Hyconus, whether he had received any letters from Malchus, and when he answered that he had received letters but those of salutation only, and when he asked the further whether he had not received any presents from him, and when he had replied that he had received no more than four horses to ride on, which Malchus had sent him, they pretended that Herod had charged these upon him as the crimes of bribery and treason, and gave order that he should be led away and slain. And in order to demonstrate that he had been guilty of no offence, when he was thus brought to his end, they alleged how mild his temper had been, and that even in his youth he had never given any demonstration of boldness or rashness, and that the case was the same when he came to begin, but that he even then committed the management of the greatest part of public affairs to Antipater, and that he was now above fourscore years old, and knew that Herod's government was in a secure state. He also came over Euphrates, and left those who greatly honored him beyond that river. Though he were to be entirely under Herod's government, that it was a most incredible thing, that he should enterprise anything by way of innovation, and not at all agreeable to his temper, but that this was a plot of Herod's contrivance. And this was the fate of Hyconus, and thus did he end his life, after he had endured various and manifold turns of fortune in his lifetime, for he was made high priest of the Jewish nation in the beginning of his mother's Alexandrius reign who held the government nine years, and when after his mother's death he took the kingdom himself and held it three months, he lost it by the means of his brother Aristobulus. He was then restored by Pompey, and received all sorts of honor from him, and enjoyed them forty years. But when he was again deprived by Antigonus, and was maimed in his body, he was made a captive by Parthians, and thence returned home again after some time. On account of the hopes that Herod had given him, none of which came to pass according to his expectation, but he still conflicted with many misfortunes, though the whole course of his life, and what was the heaviest calamity of all, as we have related already, he came to an end which was undeserved by him. His character appeared to be that of a man of a mild and moderate disposition, and suffered the administration of affairs to be generally done by others under him. He was averse to much meddling with the public, nor had shrewdness enough to govern a kingdom. And both Antipater and Herod came to their greatness by reason of his mildness, and at last he made with such an end from them as was not agreeable either to justice or piety. Now Herod, as soon as he had put Hyconus out of the way, made haste to Caesar, and because he could not have any hopes of kindness from him, on account of the friendship he had for Antony, he had a suspicion of Alexandra, lest she should take this opportunity to bring the multitude to a revolt, and introduce a sedition into the fears of the kingdom. So he committed the care of everything to his brother Pheroras, and placed his mother Cyprus, and his sister Salome, and the whole family at Masada, and gave him a charge in that if he should hear any sad news about him, he should take care of the government. But as Mariam, his wife, because of the misunderstanding between her and his sister, and his sister's mother, which made it impossible for them to live together, he placed her 
at the Alexandrium with the Alexandra her mother, and left his treasurer Joseph and Sohemus of Ituria to take care of that fortress. These two had been very faithful to him from the beginning, and were now left as a guard to the women. They also had it in charge that if they should hear any mischief had befallen him, they should kill them both, and, as far as they were able to, preserve the kingdom for his sons and for his brother Pheroros. When he had given them this charge, he made haste to Rhodes to meet Caesar. And when he had sailed to that city, he took off his diadem, but remitted nothing else of his usual dignity. And when upon his meeting him, he desired that he would let him speak to him, he therein exhibited a much more noble specimen of a great soul, for he did not betake himself to supplications, as men usually do upon such occasions, nor offered him any petition, as if he were an offender, but after an undaunted manner, and gave an account of what he had done, for he spake thus to Caesar, that he had the greatest friendship for Antony, and did everything he could that he might attain the government, that he was not indeed in the army with him, because the Arabians had diverged him, but that he had sent him both money and corn, which was but too little in comparison of what he ought to have done for him, or if a man owes himself to be another's friend, and knows him to be a benefactor, he is obliged to hazard everything to use every faculty of his soul, every member of his body, and all the wealth he hath for him, in which I confess I have been too deficient, however, I am conscious to myself that so far I have done right, I have not deserted him upon his defeat at Actium, nor upon the evident change of his fortune, have I transferred my hopes from him to another, but have preserved myself, though not as a valuable fellow-soldier, yet certainly as a faithful counsellor, to Antony, when I demonstrated to him that the only way that he had to save himself, and not to lose all his authority, was to slay Cleopatra. For when she was once dead, there would be room for him to retain his authority, and rather to bring thee to make a composition with him, than to continue at enmity any longer. None of which advices would he attend to, but preferred his own rash resolution before them, which have happened unprofitably for him, but profitably for thee. Now therefore, in case thou determinest about me, and my alacrity in serving Antony according to thy anger at him, I own there is no room for me to deny what I have done, nor will I be ashamed to own, and that publicly too, that I had a great kindness for him. But if thou wilt put him out of the case, and only examine how I behave myself to my benefactors in general, and what sort of friend I am, thou wilt find by experience that we shall do and be the same to thyself. For it is by changing the names and the firmness of friendship that we shall bear to thee, will not be disapproved by thee. By this speech, and by his behavior which showed Caesar the frankness of his mind, he greatly gained upon him, who was himself a generous and magnificent temper, and so much that those very actions which were the foundations of the accusations against him procured him Caesar's good will. Accordingly, he restored him his diadem again, and encouraged him to exhibit himself as a great friend to himself, as he had been to Antony and then had him in great esteem. Moreover, he added this, that Quintus Deodus had written to him that Herod had very readily assisted him in the affair of the gladiators. So when he had obtained such a kind reception, and had beyond all his hopes procured his crown to be more entirely and firmly settled upon him than ever by Caesar's donation, as well as by that decree of the Romans which Caesar took care to procure for his greater security, he conducted Caesar on his way to Egypt, and made presents even beyond his ability to both him and his friends, and in general behaved himself with great magnanimity. He also desired that Caesar would not put to death one Alexander, who had been a companion of Antony. But Caesar had sworn to put him to death, and so he could not obtain that his petition. And now he returned to Judea again with greater honor and assurance than ever, and affrighted those that had expectations to the contrary. And still acquiring from his very dangers greater splendor than before, by the favor of God to him. So he prepared for the reception of Caesar, as he was going out of Syria to invade Egypt. And when he came, he entertained him at Ptolemus. With all royal magnificence, he also bestowed presents on the army and brought with them provisions in abundance. 
He also proved to be one of Caesar's most cordial friends, and put the army in array, and rode along with Caesar, and had a hundred and fifty men well appointed in all respects, after a rich and sumptuous manner, for the better reception of him and his friends. He also provided them with what they should want, and as they passed over the dry desert, in so much that they lacked neither wine nor water, which last and the soldiers stood in the greatest need of. And besides, he presented Caesar with eight hundred talents, and procured to himself the good will of them all, because he was assisting to them in a much greater and more splendid degree than the kingdom he had obtained could afford, by which means he more and more demonstrated to Caesar the firmness of his friendship and his readiness to assist him. And what was the greatest advantage to him was this, that his liberality came at a seasonable time also, and when they returned again out of Egypt, his assistances were no way inferior to the good offices he had formerly done them. End of Book 15 Chapter 6 Recording by Peter Book 15, Chapter 7 of the Antiquities of the Jews, Volume 3. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Bill Mosley. Chapter 7 How Herod Slew Sohemus and Mariamne and afterward Alexandra and Costoberus, and his most intimate friends, and at last the sons of Babas also. However, when he came into his kingdom again, he found his house all in disorder, and his wife Mariamne, and her mother Alexandra very uneasy, for as they supposed, what was easy to be supposed, that they were not put into that fortress, Alexandrium, for the security of their persons, but as into a garrison for their imprisonment, and that they had no power over anything, either of others or of their own affairs. They were very uneasy, and Mariamne, supposing that the king's love to her was but hypocritical, and rather pretended as advantageous to himself than real, she looked upon it as fallacious. She also was grieved that he would not allow her any hopes of surviving him, if he should come into any harm himself. She also recollected what commands he had formerly given to Joseph, insomuch that she endeavored to please her keepers, and especially Sohemus, as well apprised how all was in his power. And at the first, Sohemus was faithful to Herod, and neglected none of the things he had given him in charge. But when the women, by kind words and liberal presents, had gained his affections over to them, he was by degrees overcome, and at length discovered to them all the king's injunctions, and this on that account principally, that he did not so much as hope he would come back with the same authority he had before so that he thought he should both escape any danger from him, and supposed that he did hereby much gratify the women, who were likely not to be overlooked in the settling of the government, nay, that they would be able to make him abundant recompense, since they must either reign themselves, or be very near to him that should reign. He had a further ground of hope also that, though Herod should have all the success he could wish for, and should return again, he could not contradict his wife in what she desired, for he knew that the king's fondness for his wife was inexpressible. These were the motives that drew Sohemus to discover what injunctions had been given him. So Mariamne was greatly displeased to hear that there was no end of the danger she was under from Herod, and was greatly uneasy at it, and wished that he might obtain no favors from Caesar, and esteemed it almost an insupportable task to live with him any longer. And this she afterward openly declared without concealing her resentment. And now Herod sailed home with joy at the unexpected good success he had had, 
and went first of all, as was proper, to this his wife, and told her, and her only, the good news, as preferring her before the rest, on account of his fondness for her, and the intimacy there had been between them, and saluted her. But so it happened that as he told her of the good success he had had, she was so far from rejoicing at it, that she rather was sorry for it, nor was she able to conceal her resentments. But depending on her dignity and the nobility of her birth, in return for his salutations, she gave a groan and declared evidently that she rather grieved than rejoiced at his success, and this till Herod was disturbed at her, as affording him not only marks of her suspicion, but evident signs of her dissatisfaction. This much troubled him to see that this surprising hatred of his wife to him was not concealed, but open, and he took this so ill, and yet was so unable to bear it, on account of the fondness he had for her, that he could not continue long in any one mind, but sometimes was angry at her, and sometimes reconciled himself to her, but by always changing one passion for another, he was still in great uncertainty, and thus was he entangled between hatred and love, and was frequently disposed to inflict punishment on her for her insolence towards him. But being deeply in love with her in his soul, he was not able to get quit of this woman. In short, as he would gladly have her punished, so was he afraid lest, ere he were aware, he should, by putting her to death, bring a heavier punishment upon himself at the same time. When Herod's sister and mother perceived that he was in this temper with regard to Mary Amney, they thought they had now got an excellent opportunity to exercise their hatred against her, and provoked Herod to wrath by telling him such long stories and calumnies about her as might at once excite his hatred and his jealousy. Now, though he willingly enough heard their words, yet had not he courage enough to do anything to her as if he believed them. But still he became worse and worse disposed to her, and these ill passions were more and more inflamed on both sides while she did not hide her disposition towards him, and he turned his love to her into wrath against her. But when he was just going to put this matter past all remedy, he heard the news that Caesar was the victor in the war, and that Anthony and Cleopatra were both dead, and that he had conquered Egypt, whereupon he made haste to go to meet Caesar, and left the affairs of his family in their present state. However, Mary Amney recommended Sohemus to him, as he was setting out on his journey, and professed that she owed him thanks for the care he had taken of her, and asked of the king for him a place in the government, upon which an honorable employment was bestowed upon him accordingly. Now when Herod was come into Egypt, he was introduced to Caesar with great freedom, as already a friend of his, and received very great favors from him, for he made him a present of those four hundred Galatians who had been Cleopatra's guards, and restored that country to him again, which, by her means, had been taken away from him. He also added to his kingdom Gadara, Hippos, and Samaria, and besides those, the maritime cities, Gaza, and Anthedon, and Joppa, and Strato's Tower. Upon these new acquisitions, he grew more magnificent, and conducted Caesar as far as Antioch. But upon his return, as much as his prosperity was augmented by the foreign additions that had been made him, so much the greater were the distresses that came upon him in his own family, and chiefly in the affair of his wife, wherein he formerly appeared to have been most of all fortunate for the affection he had for Mary Amney was no way inferior to the affections of such as are on that account celebrated in history, and this very justly. As for her, she was in other respects a chaste woman and faithful to him, yet had she somewhat of a woman rough by nature, and treated her husband imperiously enough, 
because she saw he was so fond of her as to be enslaved to her. She did not also consider seasonably with herself that she lived under a monarchy and that she was at another's disposal and accordingly would behave herself after a saucy manner to him, which yet he usually put off in a jesting way and bore with moderation and good temper. She would also expose his mother and his sister openly on account of the meanness of their birth, and would speak unkindly of them, insomuch that there was before this a disagreement and unpardonable hatred among the women, and it was now come to greater reproaches of one another than formerly, which suspicions increased, and lasted a whole year after Herod returned from Caesar. However, these misfortunes, which had been kept under some decency for a great while, burst out all at once upon such an occasion as was now offered. For as the king was one day about noon lain down on his bed to rest him, he called for Mariamne, out of the great affection he had always for her. She came in accordingly, but would not lie down by him. And when he was very desirous of her company, she showed her contempt of him and added by way of reproach that he had caused her father and her brother to be slain. And when he took this injury very unkindly, and was ready to use violence to her in a precipitate manner, the king's sister Salome, observing that he was more than ordinarily disturbed, sent in to the king his cupbearer, who had been prepared long beforehand for such a design, and bid him tell the king how Mariamne had persuaded him to give his assistance in preparing a love potion for him, and if he appeared to be greatly concerned, and to ask what that love potion was, to tell him that she had the potion, and that he was desired only to give it to him, but that, in case, he did not appear to be much concerned at this potion, to let the thing drop, and that, if he did so, no harm should thereby come to him. When she had given him these instructions, she sent him in at this time to make such a speech. So he went in after a composed manner, to gain credit to what he should say, and yet somewhat hastily, and said that Mariamne had given him presents and persuaded him to give him a love potion. And when this moved the king, he said that this love potion was a composition that she had given him, whose effects he did not know which was the reason of his resolving to give him this information as the safest course he could take, both for himself and for the king. When Herod heard what he said, and was in an ill disposition before, his indignation grew more violent, and he ordered that eunuch of Mariamne, who was most faithful to her, to be brought to torture about this potion as well knowing it was not possible that anything small or great could be done without him. And when the man was under the utmost agonies, he could say nothing concerning the thing he was tortured about, but so far he knew that Mariamne's hatred against him was occasioned by somewhat that Sohemus had said to her. Now as he was saying this, Herod cried out aloud and said that Sohemus who had been at all other times most faithful to him and to his government, would not have betrayed what injunctions he had given him unless he had had a nearer conversation than ordinary with Mariamne. So he gave order that Sohemus should be seized on and slain immediately, but he allowed his wife to take her trial and got together those that were most faithful to him and laid an elaborate accusation against her for this love potion and composition, which had been charged upon her by way of calumny only. However, he kept no temper in what he said, and was in too great a passion for judging well about this matter. Accordingly, when the court was at length satisfied that he was so resolved, they passed the sentence of death upon her. But when the sentence was passed upon her, this temper was suggested by himself and by some others of the court that she should not be thus hastily put to death, but be laid in prison in one of the fortresses 
belonging to the kingdom. But Salome and her party labored hard to have the woman put to death, and they prevailed with the king to do so, and advised this out of caution, lest the multitude should be tumultuous if she were suffered to live. And thus was Mariamne led to execution. When Alexandra observed how things went, and that there were small hopes that she herself should escape the like treatment from Herod, she changed her behavior to quite the reverse of what might have been expected from her former boldness, and this after a very indecent manner, for out of her desire to show how entirely ignorant she was of the crimes laid against Mariamne, she leaped out of her place and reproached her daughter in the hearing of all the people, and cried out that she had been an ill woman and ungrateful to her husband, and that her punishment came justly upon her for such her insolent behavior, for that she had not made proper returns to him who had been their common benefactor. And when she had for some time acted after this hypocritical manner, and been so outrageous as to tear her hair, this indecent and dissembling behavior, as was to be expected, was greatly condemned by the rest of the spectators, as it was principally by the poor woman who was to suffer, for at the first she gave her not a word, nor was discomposed at her peevishness, and only looked at her. Yet did she out of a greatness of soul discover her concern for her mother's offense, and especially for her exposing herself in a manner so unbecoming her. But as for herself, she went to her death with an unshaken firmness of mind, and without changing the color of her face, and thereby evidently discovered the nobility of her descent to the spectators, even in the last moments of her life. And thus died Mariamne, a woman of an excellent character, both for chastity and greatness of soul. But she wanted moderation, and had too much of contention in her nature. Yet had she all that can be said in the beauty of her body, and her majestic appearance in conversation. And thence arose the greatest part of the occasions why she did not prove so agreeable to the king, nor live so pleasantly with him, as she might otherwise have done. For while she was most indulgently used by the king, out of his fondness for her, and did not expect that he could do any hard thing to her, she took too unbounded a liberty. Moreover, that which most afflicted her was what he had done to her relations, and she ventured to speak of all they had suffered by him, and at last greatly provoked both the king's mother and sister, till they became enemies to her, and even he himself also did the same, on whom alone she depended for her expectations of escaping the last of punishments. But when she was once dead, the king's affections for her were kindled in a more outrageous manner than before, whose old passion for her we have already described, for his love to her was not of a calm nature nor such as we usually meet with among other husbands, for at its commencement it was of an enthusiastic kind, nor was it, by their long cohabitation and free conversation together, brought under his power to manage, but at this time his love to Mariamne seemed to seize him in such a peculiar manner as looked like divine vengeance upon him for the taking away her life for he would frequently call for her, and frequently lament for her in a most indecent manner. Moreover, he bethought him of everything he could make use of to divert his mind from thinking of her, and contrived feasts and assemblies for that purpose. But nothing would suffice. He therefore laid aside the administration of public affairs, and was so far conquered by his passion that he would order his servants to call for Mariamne, as if she were alive, and could still hear them. 
and when he was in this way there arose a pestilential disease, and carried off the greatest part of the multitude, and of his best and most esteemed friends, and made all men suspect that this was brought upon them by the anger of God, for the injustice that had been done to Mary Amney. This circumstance affected the king still more, till at length he forced himself to go into desert places, and there, under pretense of going a-hunting, bitterly afflicted himself. Yet had he not borne his grief there many days, before he fell into a most dangerous distemper himself. He had an inflammation upon him, and a pain in the hinder part of his head, joined with madness, and for the remedies that were used, they did him no good at all, but proved contrary to his case, and so at length brought him to despair. All the physicians also that were about him, partly because the medicines they brought for his recovery, could not at all conquer the disease, and partly because his diet could be no other than what his disease inclined him to, desired him to eat whatever he had a mind to, and so left the small hopes they had of his recovery in the power of that diet, and committed him to fortune. And thus did his distemper go on while he was at Samaria, now called Sebast. Now Alexandra abode at this time at Jerusalem, and being informed what condition Herod was in, she endeavored to get possession of the fortified places that were about the city, which were two, the one belonging to the city itself, the other belonging to the temple, and those that could get them into their hands had the whole nation under their power, for without the command of them it was not possible to offer their sacrifices. And to think of leaving on those sacrifices is to every Jew plainly impossible, who were still more ready to lose their lives than to leave off that divine worship which they have been wont to pay unto God. Alexandra, therefore, discoursed with those that had the keeping of these strongholds, that it was proper for them to deliver the same to her, and to Herod's sons, lest upon his death any other person should seize upon the government, and that upon his recovery none could keep them more safely for him than those of his own family. These words were not by them at all taken in good part, and as they had been in former times faithful to Herod, they resolved to continue so more than ever, both because they hated Alexandra, and because they thought it a sort of impiety to despair of Herod's recovery while he was yet alive, for they had been his old friends, and one of them, whose name was Achaibus, was his cousin German. They sent messengers, therefore, to acquaint him with Alexandra's design. So he made no longer delay, but gave orders to have her slain. Yet was it still with difficulty, and after he had endured great pain, that he got clear of his distemper. He was still sorely afflicted, both in mind and body, and made very uneasy, and readier than ever upon all occasions, to inflict punishment upon those that fell under his hand. He also slew the most intimate of his friends, Costobarus, and Lysimachus, and Cadius, who was also called Antipater, as also Dosithius, and that upon the following occasion. Costobarus was an Idumean by birth, and one of principal dignity among them, and one whose ancestors had been priests to the Coes, whom the Idumeans had formerly esteemed as a god. But after Hyrcanus had made a change in their political government and made them receive the Jewish customs and law, Herod made Costobarus governor of Idumea and Gaza, and gave him his sister Salome to wife, and this was upon the slaughter of his uncle Joseph, who had that government before, as we have related already. When Costobarus had gotten to be so highly advanced, it pleased him, and was more than he hoped for, and he was more and more puffed up by his good success, 
and in a little while he exceeded all bounds, and did not think fit to obey what Herod as their ruler commanded him, or that the Idumeans should make use of the Jewish customs, or be subject to them. He therefore sent to Cleopatra, and informed her that the Idumeans had been always under his progenitors, and that for the same reason it was but just that she should desire that country for him of Antony. For that he was ready to transfer his friendship to her, and this he did, not because he was better pleased to be under Cleopatra's government, but because he thought that, upon the diminution of Herod's power, it would not be difficult for him to obtain himself the entire government over the Edomians, and somewhat more also, for he raised his hopes still higher, as having no small pretenses, both by his birth and by these riches, which he had gotten by his constant attention to filthy lucre. And accordingly it was not a small matter that he aimed at. So Cleopatra desired this country of Antony, but failed of her purpose. An account of this was brought to Herod, who was thereupon ready to kill Costobarus, yet upon the entreaties of his sister and mother, he forgave him and vouchsafed to pardon him entirely, though he still had a suspicion of him afterward for this his attempt. But some time afterward, when Salome happened to quarrel with Costobarus, she sent him a bill of divorce and dissolved her marriage with him though this was not according to the Jewish laws, for with us it is lawful for a husband to do so, but a wife, if she departs from her husband, cannot of herself be married to another, unless her former husband put her away. However, Salome chose to follow not the law of her country, but the law of her authority, and so renounced her wedlock, and told her brother Herod, that she left her husband out of her good will to him, because she perceived that he, with Antipater and Lysimachus and Dositheus, were raising a sedition against him, as an evidence whereof she alleged the case of the sons of Babas, that they had been by him preserved alive already for the interval of twelve years, which proved to be true. But when Herod thus unexpectedly heard of it, he was greatly surprised at it, and was the more surprised because the relation appeared incredible to him. As for the fact relating to the sons of Babas, Herod had formerly taken great pains to bring them to punishment, as being enemies to his government. But they were now forgotten by him, on account of the length of time since he had ordered them to be slain. Now the cause of his ill will and hatred to them arose hence, that while Antigonus was king, Herod, with his army, besieged the city of Jerusalem, where the distress and miseries which the besieged endured were so pressing, that the greater number of them invited Herod into the city, and already placed their hopes on him. Now the sons of Babas were of great dignity, and had power among the people, and were faithful to Antigonus, and were always raising calumnies against Herod, and encouraged the people to preserve the government to that royal family which held it by inheritance. So these men acted thus politically, and as they thought, for their own advantage. But when the city was taken, and Herod had gotten the government into his hands, and Costobarus was appointed to hinder men from passing out at the gates, and to guard the city, that those citizens that were guilty, and of the party opposite to the king, might not get out of it. Costobarus, being sensible that the sons of Babas were had in respect and honor by the whole multitude, and supposing that their preservation might be of great advantage to him in the changes of government afterward, he set them by themselves, and concealed them in his own farms, and when the thing was suspected, he assured Herod upon oath that he really knew nothing of that matter, and so overcame the suspicions that lay upon him. Nay, after that, when the king had publicly proposed a reward for the discovery 
and had put in practice all sorts of methods for searching out this matter, he would not confess it, but being persuaded that when he had at first denied it, if the men were found, he should not escape unpunished, he was forced to keep them secret, not only out of his good will to them, but out of a necessary regard to his own preservation also. But when the king knew the thing, by his sister's information, he sent men to the places where he had the intimation they were concealed, and ordered both them and those that were accused as guilty with them to be slain, insomuch that there were now none at all left of the kindred of Hyrcanus, and the kingdom was entirely in Herod's own power, and there was nobody remaining of such dignity as could put a stop to what he did against the Jewish laws. End of Book 15 Chapter 7 Recording by Bill Mosley Ralsburg, Texas, USA. Book 15, Chapters 8 and 9 of the Antiquities of the Jews, Volume 3. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Guero. The Antiquities of the Jews, Volume 3, by Flavius Josephus, translated by William Whiston, Book 15, Chapters 8 and 9. Chapter 8. How Ten Men of the Citizens of Jerusalem Made a Conspiracy Against Herod for the Foreign Practices He Had Introduced, Which Was a Transgression of the Laws of Their Country, Concerning the Building of Sebasti and Caesarea and other edifices of Herod. On this account it was that Herod revolted from the laws of his country, and corrupted their ancient constitution, by the introduction of foreign practices, which constitution yet ought to have been preserved inviolable, by which means we became guilty of great wickedness afterward, while those religious observances which used to lead the multitude to piety were now neglected. For in the first place he appointed solemn games to be celebrated every fifth year, in honor of Caesar, and built a theater at Jerusalem, as also a very great amphitheater in the plain. Both of them were indeed costly works, but opposite to the Jewish customs, for we have had no such shows delivered down to us as fit to be used or exhibited by us. Yet did he celebrate these games every five years, in the most solemn and splendid manner. He also made proclamation to the neighboring countries, and called men together out of every nation. The wrestlers also, and the rest of those that strove for the prizes in such games, were invited out of every land, both by the hopes of the rewards there to be bestowed, and by the glory of victory to be there gained. So the principal persons that were the most eminent in these sorts of exercises were gotten together, for there were very great rewards for victory proposed, not only to those that performed their exercises naked, but to those that played the musicians also, and were called Thimeliki. And he spared no pains to induce all persons, the most famous for such exercises, to come to this contest for victory. He also proposed no small rewards to those who ran for the prizes in chariot races, when they were drawn by two or three or four pair of horses. He also imitated everything, though never so costly or magnificent in other nations, out of an ambition that he might give most public demonstration of his grandeur. Inscriptions also of the great actions of Caesar, and trophies of those nations which he had conquered in his wars, and all made of the purest gold and silver, encompassed the theater itself. Nor was there anything that could be subservient to his design, whether it were precious garments or precious stones set in order, which was not also exposed to sight in these games. He had also made a great preparation of wild beasts, and of lions themselves in great abundance, and of such other beasts as were either of common strength, or of such a sort as were rarely seen. 
These were prepared either to fight with one another, or that men who were condemned to death were to fight with them. And truly foreigners were greatly surprised and delighted at the vastness of the expenses here exhibited, and at the great dangers that were here seen, but to natural Jews this was no better than a dissolution of those customs for which they had so great a veneration. It appeared also no better than an instance of barefaced impiety to throw men to wild beasts, for the affording delight to the spectators. And it appeared an instance of no less impiety to change their own laws for such foreign exercises. But above all the rest, the trophies gave most distaste to the Jews, for as they imagined them to be images included within the armor that hung round about them, they were sorely displeased at them, because it was not the custom of their country to pay honors to such images. Nor was Herod unacquainted with the disturbance they were under, and as he thought it unseasonable to use violence with them, so he spake to some of them by way of consolation, and in order to free them from that superstitious fear they were under, yet could not he satisfy them, but they cried out with one accord, out of their great uneasiness at the offenses they thought he had been guilty of, that although they should think of bearing all the rest, yet would they never bear images of men in their city, meaning the trophies, because this was disagreeable to the laws of their country. Now when Herod saw them in such a disorder, and that they would not easily change their resolution unless they received satisfaction in this point, he called to him the most eminent men among them, and brought them upon the theater, and showed them the trophies, and asked them what sort of things they took these trophies to be. And when they cried out that they were the images of men, he gave order that they should be stripped of these outward ornaments which were about them, and showed them the naked pieces of wood, which pieces of wood, now without any ornament, became matter of great sport and laughter to them, because they had before always had the ornaments of images themselves in derision. When, therefore, Herod had thus got clear of the multitude, and had dissipated the vehemency of passion under which they had been, the greatest part of the people were disposed to change their conduct, and not to be displeased at him any longer. But still some of them continued in their displeasure against him, for his introduction of new customs, and esteemed the violation of the laws of their country as likely to be the origin of very great mischiefs to them, so that they deemed it an instance of piety rather to hazard themselves to be put to death, than to seem as if they took no notice of Herod, who, upon the change he had made in their government, introduced such customs, and that in a violent manner, which they had never been used to before, as indeed in pretense a king, but in reality one that showed himself an enemy to their whole nation. On which account ten men that were citizens of Jerusalem conspired together against him, and sware to one another to undergo any dangers in the attempt, and took daggers with them under their garments for the purpose of killing Herod. Now there was a certain blind man among those conspirators, who had thus sworn to one another, on account of the indignation he had against what he heard to have been done. He was not indeed able to afford the rest any assistance in the undertaking, but was ready to undergo any suffering with them, if so be they should come to any harm, insomuch that he became a very great encourager of the rest of the undertakers. When they had taken this resolution, and that by common consent, they went into the theater, hoping that in the first place Herod himself could not escape them, as they should fall upon him so unexpectedly, and supposing, however, that if they missed him, they should kill a great many of those that were about him. And this resolution they took, though they should die for it, in order to suggest to the king what injuries he had done to the multitude. These conspirators, therefore, standing thus prepared beforehand, went about their design with great alacrity. But there was one of those spies of Herod that were appointed for such purposes to fish out and inform him of any conspiracies that should be made against him, who found out the whole affair, and told the king of it, as he was about to go into the theater. So when he reflected on the hatred which he knew the greatest part of the people bore him, and on the disturbances that arose upon every occasion, 
he thought this plot against him not to be improbable. Accordingly, he retired into his palace, and called those that were accused of this conspiracy before him by their several names, and as, upon the guards falling upon them, they were caught in the very fact, and knew they could not escape. They prepared themselves for their ends, with all the decency they could, and so as not at all to recede from their resolute behavior, for they showed no shame for what they were about, nor denied it. But when they were seized, they showed their daggers, and professed that the conspiracy they had sworn to was a holy and pious action, that what they intended to do was not for gain, or out of any indulgence to their passions, but principally for those common customs of their country, which all the Jews were obliged to observe, or to die for them. This was what these men said, out of their undaunted courage in this conspiracy. So they were led away to execution by the king's guards that stood about them, and patiently underwent all the torments inflicted on them till they died. Nor was it long before that spy who had discovered them was seized on by some of the people, out of the hatred they bore to him, and was not only slain by them, but pulled to pieces, limb from limb, and given to the dogs. This execution was seen by many of the citizens, yet would not one of them discover the doers of it, till upon Herod's making a strict scrutiny after them, by bitter and severe tortures, certain women that were tortured confessed what they had seen done, the authors of which fact were so terribly punished by the king, that their entire families were destroyed for this their rash attempt, yet did not the obstinacy of the people, and that undaunted constancy they showed in the defense of their laws, make Herod any easier to them. But he still strengthened himself after a more secure manner, and resolved to encompass the multitude every way, lest such innovations should end in an open rebellion. Since, therefore, he had now the city fortified by the palace in which he lived, and by the temple which had a strong fortress by it called Antonia, and was rebuilt by himself, he contrived to make Samaria a fortress for himself also against all the people, and called it Sebasti, supposing that this place would be a stronghold against the country, not inferior to the former. So he fortified that place, which was a day's journey distant from Jerusalem, and which would be useful to him in common, to keep both the country and the city in awe. He also built another fortress for the whole nation. It was of old called Strato's Tower, but was by him named Caesarea. Moreover, he chose out some select horsemen, and placed them ill the great plain, and built for them a place in Galilee called Gaba with Hesabonitis in Perea. And these were the places which he particularly built, while he always was inventing somewhat further for his own security, and encompassing the whole nation with guards, that they might by no means get from under his power, nor fall into tumults, which they did continually upon any small commotion, and that if they did make any commotions, he might know of it while some of his spies might be upon them from the neighborhood, and might both be able to know what they were attempting, and to prevent it. And when he went about building the wall of Samaria, he contrived to bring thither many of those that had been assisting to him in his wars, and many of the people in that neighborhood also, whom he made fellow citizens with the rest. This he did out of an ambitious desire of building a temple, and out of a desire to make the city more eminent than it had been before, but principally because he contrived that it might at once be for his own security and a monument of his magnificence. He also changed its name, and called it Sebasti. Moreover, he parted the adjoining country, which was excellent in its kind, among the inhabitants of Samaria, that they might be in a happy condition upon their first coming to inhabit besides all which, he encompassed the city with a wall of great strength, and made use of the acclivity of the place for making its fortifications stronger. Nor was the compass of the place made now so small, as it had been before, but was such as rendered it not inferior to the most famous cities, for it was twenty furlongs in circumference. Now within, and about the middle of it, he built a sacred place, 
of a furlong and a half in circuit, and adorned it with all sorts of decorations, and therein erected a temple, which was illustrious on account of both its largeness and beauty. And as to the several parts of the city, he adorned them with decorations of all sorts also. And as to what was necessary to provide for his own security, he made the walls very strong for that purpose, and made it for the greatest part a citadel. And as to the elegance of the building, it was taken care of also, that he might leave monuments of the fineness of his taste, and of his beneficence to future ages. CHAPTER nine Concerning the famine that happened in Judea and Syria, and how Herod, after he married another wife, rebuilt Caesarea, and other Grecian cities. Now on this very year, which was the thirteenth year of the reign of Herod, very great calamities came upon the country, whether they were derived from the anger of God, or whether this misery returns again naturally in certain periods of time, for in the first place there were perpetual droughts, and for that reason the ground was barren, and did not bring forth the same quantity of fruits that it used to produce. And after this barrenness of the soil, that change of food which the want of corn occasioned produced distempers in the bodies of men, and a pestilential disease prevailed, one misery following upon the back of another, and these circumstances, that they were destitute both of methods of cure and of food, made the pestilential distemper, which began after a violent manner, the more lasting. The destruction of men also after such a manner deprived those that survived of all their courage, because they had no way to provide remedies sufficient for the distresses they were in. When, therefore, the fruits of that year were spoiled, and whatsoever they had laid up beforehand was spent, there was no foundation of hope for relief remaining, but the misery, contrary to what they expected, still increased upon them, and this not only on that year, while they had nothing for themselves left at the end of it, but what seed they had sown perished also, by reason of the ground not yielding its fruits on the second year. This distress they were in made them also, out of necessity, to eat many things that did not use to be eaten, nor was the king himself free from this distress any more than other men, as being deprived of that tribute he used to have from the fruits of the ground, and having already expended what money he had in his liberality to those whose cities he had built. Nor had he any people that were worthy of his assistance, since this miserable state of things had procured him the hatred of his subjects. For it is a constant rule that misfortunes are still laid to the account of those that govern. In these circumstances he considered with himself how to procure some seasonable help, but this was a hard thing to be done, while their neighbors had no food to sell them, and their money also was gone, had it been possible to purchase a little food at a great price. However, he thought it his best way, by all means, not to leave off his endeavors to assist his people. So he cut off the rich furniture that was in his palace, both of silver and gold, insomuch that he did not spare the finest vessels he had, or those that were made with the most elaborate skill of the artificers, but sent the money to Petronius, who had been made prefect of Egypt by Caesar, and as not a few had already fled to him under their necessities, and as he was particularly a friend of Herod, and desirous to have his subjects preserved, he gave leave to them in the first place to export corn, and assisted them every way, both in purchasing and exporting the same, so that he was the principal, if not the only person, who afforded them what help they had. And Herod, taking care that people should understand that this help came from himself, did thereby not only remove the ill opinion of those that formerly hated him, but gave them the greatest demonstration possible of his good will to them and care of them. For in the first place, as for those who were able to provide their own food, he distributed to them their proportion of corn in the exactest manner. But for those many that were not able, either by reason of their old age or any other infirmity, to provide food for themselves, he made this provision for them. The bakers should make their bread ready for them.
He also took care that they might not be hurt by the dangers of winter, since they were in great want of clothing also, by reason of the utter destruction and consumption of their sheep and goats, till they had no wool to make use of, nor anything else to cover themselves withal. And when he had procured these things for his own subjects, he went further, in order to provide necessaries for their neighbors, and gave seed to the Syrians, which thing turned greatly to his own advantage, also this charitable assistance being afforded most seasonably to their fruitful soil, so that every one had now a plentiful provision of food. Upon the whole, when the harvest of the land was approaching, he sent no fewer than fifty thousand men, whom he had sustained, into the country, by which means he both repaired the afflicted condition of his own kingdom with great generosity and diligence, and lightened the afflictions of his neighbors, who were under the same calamities. For there was nobody who had been in want that was left destitute of a suitable assistance by him. Nay, further, there were neither any people, nor any cities, nor any private men, who were to make provision for the multitudes, and on that account were in want of support, and had recourse to him, but received what they stood in need of, insomuch that it appeared, upon a computation, that the number of quarry of wheat, of ten Attic Medimni apiece, that were given to foreigners, amounted to ten thousand, and the number that was given in his own kingdom was about fourscore thousand. Now it happened that this care of his, and this seasonable benefaction, had such influence on the Jews, and was so cried up among other nations as to wipe off that old hatred which his violation of some of their customs, during his reign, had procured him among all the nation, and that this liberality of his assistance in this their greatest necessity was full satisfaction for all that he had done of that nature, as it also procured him great fame among foreigners. And it looked as if these calamities that afflicted his land to a degree plainly incredible came in order to raise his glory and to be to his great advantage, for the greatness of his liberality in these distresses, which he now demonstrated beyond all expectation, did so change the disposition of the multitude towards him, that they were ready to suppose he had been from the beginning not such a one as they had found him to be by experience, but such a one as the care he had taken of them in supplying their necessities proved him now to be. About this time it was that he sent five hundred chosen men out of the guards of his body as auxiliaries to Caesar, whom Alias Gallus led to the Red Sea, and who were of great service to him there. When therefore his affairs were thus improved, and were again in a flourishing condition, he built himself a palace in the upper city, raising the rooms to a very great height, and adorning them with the most costly furniture of gold and marble scats, and beds and these were so large that they could contain very many companies of men. These apartments were also of distinct magnitudes, and had particular names given them, for one apartment was called Caesar's, another Agrippa's. He also fell in love again, and married another wife, not suffering his reason to hinder him from living as he pleased. The occasion of this his marriage was as follows. There was one Simon, a citizen of Jerusalem, the son of one Boethus, a citizen of Alexandria, and a priest of great note there. This man had a daughter, who was esteemed the most beautiful woman of that time, and when the people of Jerusalem began to speak much in her commendation, it happened that Herod was much affected with what was said of her, and when he saw the damsel, he was smitten with her beauty. Yet did he entirely reject the thoughts of using his authority to abuse her, as believing what was the truth, that by so doing he should be stigmatized for violence and tyranny, so he thought it best to take the damsel to wife. And while Simon was of a dignity too inferior to be allied to him, but still too considerable to be despised, he governed his inclinations after the most prudent manner, by augmenting the dignity of the family, and making them more honorable. So he immediately deprived Jesus, the son of Phabet, of the high priesthood, and conferred that dignity on Simon, and so joined in affinity with him by marrying his daughter. When this wedding was over, 
he built another citadel in that place where he had conquered file jews when he was driven out of his government and antigonus enjoyed it this citadel is distant from jerusalem about threescore furlongs it was strong by nature and fit for such a building it is a sort of a moderate hill raised to a further height by the hand of a man till it was of the shape of a woman's breast it is encompassed with circular towers and hath a straight ascent up to it which ascent is composed of steps of polished stones in number two hundred within it are royal and very rich apartments of a structure that provided both for security and for beauty about the bottom there are habitations of such a structure as are well worth seeing both on other accounts and also on account of the water which is brought thither from a great way off and at vast expenses for the place itself is destitute of water the plain that is about this citadel is full of edifices not inferior to any city in largeness and having the hill above it in the nature of a castle and now when all herod's designs had succeeded according to his hopes he had not the least suspicion that any troubles could arise in his kingdom because he kept his people obedient as well by the fear they stood in of him for he was implacable in the infliction of his punishments as by the provident care he had showed towards them after the most magnanimous manner when they were under their distresses but still he took care to have external security for his government as a fortress against his subjects for the orations he made to the cities were very fine and full of kindness and he cultivated a seasonable good understanding with their governors and bestowed presents on every one of them inducing them thereby to be more friendly to him and using his magnificent disposition so as his kingdom might be the better secured to him and this till all his affairs were every way more and more augmented but then this magnificent temper of his and that submissive behavior and liberality which he exercised towards caesar and the most powerful men of rome obliged him to transgress the customs of his nation and to set aside many of their laws and by building cities after an extravagant manner and erecting temples not in judea indeed for that would not have been born it being forbidden for us to pay any honor to images or representations of animals after the manner of the greeks but still he did thus in the country properly out of our bounds and in the cities thereof the apology which he made to the jews for these things was this that all was done not out of his own inclinations but by the commands and injunctions of others in order to please caesar and the romans as though he had not the jewish customs so much in his eye as he had the honor of those romans while yet he had himself entirely in view all the while and indeed was very ambitious to leave great monuments of his government to posterity whence it was that he was so zealous in building such fine cities and spent such vast sums of money upon them now upon his observation of a place near the sea which was very proper for containing a city and was before called strato's tower he set about getting a plan for a magnificent city there and erected many edifices with great diligence all over it and this of white stone he also adorned it with most sumptuous palaces and large edifices for containing the people and what was the greatest and most laborious work of all he adorned it with a haven that was always free from the waves of the sea its largeness was not less than the pyramum at athens and had towards the city a double station for the ships it was of excellent workmanship and this was the more remarkable for its being built in a place that of itself was not suitable to such noble structures but was to be brought to perfection by materials from other places and at very great expenses this city is situate in phoenicia in the passage by sea to egypt between joppa and dora which are lesser maritime cities and not fit for havens on account of the impetuous south winds that beat upon them which rolling the sands that came from the sea against the shores do not admit of ships lying in their station but the merchants are generally there forced to ride at their anchors in the sea itself 
so Herod endeavored to rectify this inconvenience, and laid out such a compass towards the land as might be sufficient for a haven, wherein the great ships might lie in safety. And this he effected by letting down vast stones of above fifty feet in length, not less than eighteen in breadth, and nine in depth, into twenty fathom deep. And as some were lesser, so were others bigger than those dimensions. This mole which he built by the seaside was two hundred feet wide, the half of which was opposed to the current of the waves, so as to keep off those waves which were to break upon them, and so was called prosimatia, or the first breaker of the waves. But the other half had upon it a wall with several towers, the largest of which was named Drusus, and was a work of very great excellence, and had its name from Drusus, the son-in-law of Caesar, who died young. There were also a great number of arches where the mariners dwelt. There was also before them a quay, or landing-place, which ran around the entire haven, and was a most agreeable walk to such as had a mind to that exercise. But the entrance or mouth of the port was made on the north quarter, on which side was the stillest of the winds of all in this place, and the basis of the whole circuit on the left hand as you enter the port supported a round turret, which was made very strong in order to resist the greatest waves, while on the right hand as you enter stood two vast stones, and those each of them larger than the turret, which were over against them. These stood upright and were joined together." Now there were edifices all along the circular haven, made of the politest stone, with a certain elevation whereon was erected a temple that was seen a great way off by those that were sailing for that haven, and had in it two statues, the one of Rome, the other of Caesar. The city itself was called Caesarea, which was also itself built of fine materials, and was of a fine structure. Nay, the very subterranean vaults and cellars had no less of architecture bestowed on them than had the buildings above ground. Some of these vaults carried things at even distances to the haven and to the sea, but one of them ran obliquely and bound all the rest together, that both the rain and the filth of the citizens were together carried off with ease, and the sea itself, upon the flux of the tide from without, came into the city, and washed it all clean. Herod also built therein a theater of stone, and on the south quarter, behind the port, an amphitheater also capable of holding a vast number of men, and conveniently situated for a prospect to the sea. So this city was thus finished in twelve years, during which time the king did not fail to go on both with the work and to pay the charges that were necessary. End of Book 15, Chapters 8 and 9 Recording by Guero Book 15, Chapters 10 and 11 Of the Antiquities of the Jews, Volume 3 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Bill Mosley. The Antiquities of the Jews, Volume 3, by Flavius Josephus. Translated by William Whiston. Book 15, Chapters 10 and 11. Chapter 10. How Herod sent his sons to Rome, how also he was accused by Zenodorus and the Gadarans, but was cleared of what they accused him of, and withal gained to himself the goodwill of Caesar. Concerning the Pharisees, the Essenes, and Menahem. When Herod was engaged in such matters, and when he had already re-edified Sebast, Samaria, he resolved to send his sons Alexander and Aristobulus to Rome to enjoy the company of Caesar, who, when they came thither, 
lodged at the house of Polio, who was very fond of Herod's friendship, and they had leave to lodge in Caesar's own palace, for he received these sons of Herod with all humanity, and gave Herod leave to give his kingdom to which of his sons he pleased. And besides all this, he bestowed on him Trachon and Batania and Aronitus, which he gave him on the occasion following. One Zenodorus had hired what was called the house of Lysanias, who, as he was not satisfied with his revenues, became a partner with the robbers that inhabited the Trachonites, and so procured himself a larger income. For the inhabitants of those places lived in a mad way, and pillaged the country of the Damascenes, while Zenodorus did not restrain them, but partook of the prey they acquired. Now, as the neighboring people were hereby great sufferers, they complained to Varro, who was then president of Syria, and entreated him to write to Caesar about this injustice of Zenodorus. When these matters were laid before Caesar, he rode back to Varro to destroy those nests of robbers, and to give the land to Herod, that so, by his care, the neighboring countries might be no longer disturbed with these doings of the Trachonites, for it was not an easy firing to restrain them, since this way of robbery had been their usual practice, and they had no other way to get their living, because they had neither any city of their own, nor lands in their possession, but only some receptacles and dens in the earth, and there they and their cattle lived in common together. However, they had made contrivances to get pools of water, and laid up corn and granaries for themselves, and were able to make great resistance by issuing out on the sudden against any that attacked them, for the entrances of their caves were narrow, in which but one could come in at a time, and the places within incredibly large, and made very wide, but the ground over their habitations was not very high, but rather on a plain, while the rocks are altogether hard and difficult to be entered upon. Unless any one gets into the plain road by the guidance of another, for these roads are not straight, but have several revolutions. But when these men are hindered from their wicked preying upon their neighbors, their custom is to prey one upon another, insomuch that no sort of injustice comes amiss to them. But when Herod had received this grant from Caesar, and was come into this country, he procured skillful guides, and put a stop to their wicked robberies, and procured peace and quietness to the neighboring people. Hereupon Zenodorus was grieved, in the first place because his principality was taken away from him, and still more so because he envied Herod who had gotten it. So he went up to Rome to accuse him but returned back again without success. Now Agrippa was about this time sent to succeed Caesar in the government of the countries beyond the Ionian Sea, upon whom Herod lighted when he was wintering about Mytilene, for he had been his particular friend and companion, and then returned into Judea again. However, some of the Gadarenes came to Agrippa, and accused Herod, whom he sent back bound to the king without giving them the hearing. But still the Arabians, who of old bear ill will to Herod's government, were nettled, and at that time attempted to raise a sedition in his dominions, and as they thought upon a more justifiable occasion, for Zenodorus, despairing already of success as to his own affairs, prevented his enemies by selling to those Arabians a part of his principality called Aronitus for the value of fifty talents. 
but as this was included in the donations of Caesar, they contested the point with Herod, as unjustly deprived of what they had bought. Sometimes they did this by making incursions upon him, and sometimes by attempting force against him, and sometimes by going to law with him. Moreover, they persuaded the poorer soldiers to help them, and were troublesome to him, out of a constant hope that they should reduce the people to raise a sedition, in which designs those that are in the most miserable circumstances of life are still the most earnest. And although Herod had been a great while apprised of these attempts, yet did not he indulge any severity to them, but by rational methods aimed to mitigate things, as not willing to give any handle for tumults. Now when Herod had already reigned seventeen years, Caesar came into Syria, at which time the greatest part of the inhabitants of Gadara clamored against Herod, as one that was heavy in his injunctions and tyrannical. These reproaches they mainly ventured upon by the encouragement of Zenodorus, who took his oath that he would never leave Herod till he had procured that they should be severed from Herod's kingdom and joined to Caesar's province. The Gadarenes were induced hereby and made no small cry against him, and that the more boldly because those that had been delivered up by Agrippa were not punished by Herod, who let them go, and did them no harm, for indeed he was the principal man in the world who appeared almost inexorable in punishing crimes in his own family, but very generous in remitting the offenses that were committed elsewhere. And while they accused Herod of injuries, and plunderings, and subversions of temples, he stood unconcerned, and was ready to make his defense. However, Caesar gave him his right hand, and remitted nothing of his kindness to him upon this disturbance by the multitude. And indeed, these things were alleged the first day, but the hearing proceeded no further. For as the Gadarenes saw the inclination of Caesar and of his assessors, and expected, as they had reason to do, that they should be delivered up to the king, some of them, out of a dread of the torments they might undergo, cut their own throats in the night time, and some of them threw themselves down precipices, and others of them cast themselves into the river and destroyed themselves of their own accord, which accidents seemed a sufficient condemnation of the rashness and crimes they had been guilty of. Whereupon Caesar made no longer delay, but cleared Herod from the crimes he was accused of. Another happy accident there was, which was a further great advantage to Herod at this time, for Zenodorus's belly burst, and a great quantity of blood issued from him in his sickness, and he thereby departed this life at Antioch in Syria. So Caesar bestowed his country, which was no small one, upon Herod. It lay between Trachon and Galilee, and contained Eulatha and Panias, and the country round about. He also made him one of the procurators of Syria, and commanded that they should do everything with his approbation, and, in short, he arrived at that pitch of felicity that whereas there were but two men that governed the vast Roman Empire, first Caesar and then Agrippa, who was his principal favorite. Caesar preferred no one to Herod besides Agrippa, and Agrippa made no one his greater friend than Herod besides Caesar. And when he had acquired such freedom, he begged of Caesar a tetrarchy for his brother Ferorus, while he did himself bestow upon him a revenue of a hundred talents out of his own kingdom, that in case he came to any harm himself, 
his brother might be in safety, and that his sons might not have dominion over him. So when he had conducted Caesar to the sea, and was returned home, he built him a most beautiful temple of the whitest stone in Zenodorus's country, near the place called Panlure. This is a very fine cave in a mountain, under which there is a great cavity in the earth, and the cavern is abrupt and prodigiously deep and full of a still water. Over it hangs a vast mountain, and under the caverns arise the springs of the river Jordan. Herod adorned this place, which was already a very remarkable one, still further by the erection of this temple, which he dedicated to Caesar at which time Herod released to his subjects the third part of their taxes, under pretense indeed of relieving them, after the dearth they had had, but the main reason was to recover their good will, which he now wanted, for they were uneasy at him, because of the innovations he had introduced in their practices, of the dissolution of their religion, and of the disuse of their own customs. And the people everywhere talked against him, like those that were still more provoked and disturbed at his procedure, against which discontents he greatly guarded himself, and took away the opportunities they might have to disturb him, and enjoined them to be always at work, nor did he permit the citizens either to meet together or to walk or eat together, but watched everything they did, and when they were caught, they were severely punished, and many there were who were brought to the citadel Hyrcania, both openly and secretly, and were there put to death. And there were spies set everywhere, both in the city and in the roads, who watched those that met together. Nay, it is reported that he did not himself neglect this part of caution, but that he would oftentimes himself take the habit of a private man and mix among the multitude in the night time and make trial what opinion they had of his government. And as for those that could no way be reduced to acquiesce under his scheme of government, he prosecuted them all manner of ways. But for the rest of the multitude, he required that they should be obliged to take an oath of fidelity to him, and at the same time compelled them to swear that they would bear him good will, and continue certainly so to do in his management of the government. And indeed a great part of them, either to please him or out of fear of him, yielded to what he required of them but for such as were of a more open and generous disposition, and had indignation at the force he used to them, he by one means or other made away with them. He endeavored also to persuade Polio, the Pharisee, and Satnias, and the greatest part of their scholars, to take the oath, but these would neither submit so to do, nor were they punished together with the rest out of the reverence he bore to polio. The Essenes also, as we call a sect of ours, were excused from this imposition. These men lived the same kind of life as do those whom the Greeks call Pythagoreans, concerning whom I shall discourse more fully elsewhere. However, it is but fit to set down here the reasons wherefore Herod had these Essenes in such honor, and thought higher of them than their mortal nature required, nor will this account be unsuitable to the nature of this history, as it will show the opinion men had of these Essenes. Now there was one of these Essenes, whose name was Manahem, who had this testimony that he not only conducted his life after an excellent manner, 
but had the foreknowledge of future events given him by God also. This man once saw Herod when he was a child, and going to school, and saluted him as king of the Jews. But he, thinking that either he did not know him, or that he was in jest, put him in mind that he was but a private man. But Menahem smiled to himself, and clapped him on his backside with his hand, and said, However that be, thou wilt be king, and wilt begin thy reign happily, for God finds thee worthy of it. And do thou remember the blows that Menahem hath given thee, as being a signal of the change of thy fortune. And truly, this will be the best reasoning for thee, that thou love justice towards men, and piety towards God, and clemency towards thy citizens. Yet do I know how thy whole conduct will be, that thou wilt not be such a one, for thou wilt excel all men in happiness, and obtain an everlasting reputation, but wilt forget piety and righteousness, and these crimes will not be concealed from God at the conclusion of thy life, when thou wilt find that he will be mindful of them, and punish time for them. Now at that time Herod did not at all attend to what Menahem said, as having no hopes of such advancement. But a little afterward, when he was so fortunate as to be advanced to the dignity of king, and was in the height of his dominion, he sent for Menahem, and asked him how long he should reign. Menahem did not tell him the full length of his reign, Wherefore, upon that silence of his, he asked him further whether he should reign ten years or not. He replied, Yes, twenty, nay, thirty years, but did not assign the just determinate limit of his reign. Herod was satisfied with these replies, and gave Menahem his hand, and dismissed him, and from that time he continued to honor all the Essenes. We have thought it proper to relate these facts to our readers, how strange soever they be, and to declare what hath happened among us, because many of these Essenes have by their excellent virtue been thought worthy of this knowledge of divine revelations. Chapter 11 how Herod rebuilt the temple, and raised it higher, and made it more magnificent than it was before, as also concerning that tower which he called Antonia. And now Herod, in the eighteenth year of his reign, and after the acts already mentioned, undertook a very great work, that is, to build of himself the temple of God, and make it larger in compass, and to raise it to a most magnificent altitude, as esteeming it to be the most glorious of all his actions, as it really was to bring it to perfection, and that this would be sufficient for an everlasting memorial of him. But as he knew the multitude were not ready nor willing to assist him in so vast a design, he thought to prepare them first by making a speech to them, and then set about the work itself. So he called them together, and spake thus to them, I think I need not speak to you, my countrymen, about such other works as I have done since I came to the kingdom. Although I may say, they have been performed in such a manner as to bring more security to you, than glory to myself. For I have neither been negligent in the most difficult times about what tended to ease your necessities, nor have the buildings. I have been so proper to preserve me as yourselves from injuries, and I imagine that with God's assistance I have advanced the nation of the Jews to a degree of happiness which they never had before and for the particular edifices belonging to your own country, 
and your own cities, as also to those cities that we have lately acquired, which we have erected and greatly adorned, and thereby augmented the dignity of your nation. It seems to me a needless task to enumerate them to you, since you well know them yourselves. But as to that undertaking which I have a mind to set about at present, and which will be a work of the greatest piety and excellence that can possibly be undertaken by us, I will now declare it to you. Our fathers, indeed, when they were returned from Babylon, built this temple to God Almighty. Yet does it want sixty cubits of its largeness and altitude, for so much did that first temple which Solomon built exceed this temple. Nor let any one condemn our fathers for their negligence or want of piety herein, for it was not their fault that the temple was no higher. For they were Cyrus and Darius, the son of Histaspes, who determined the measure for its rebuilding. And it hath been by reason of the subjection of those fathers of ours to them and to their posterity, and after them to the Macedonians, that they had not the opportunity to follow the original model of this pious edifice, nor could raise it to its ancient altitude. But since I am now by God's will your governor, and I have had peace a long time, have gained great riches and large revenues, and what is the principal filing of all, I am at amity with and well regarded by the Romans, who, if I may so say, are the rulers of the whole world. I will do my endeavor to correct that imperfection, which hath arisen from the necessity of our affairs, and the slavery we have been under formerly, and to make a thankful return, after the most pious manner, to God, for what blessings I have received from him, by giving me this kingdom, and that by rendering his temple as complete as I am able. And this was the speech which Herod made to them. But still this speech affrighted many of the people, as being unexpected by them, and because it seemed incredible, it did not encourage them, but put a damp upon them, for they were afraid that he would pull down the whole edifice, and not be able to bring his intentions to perfection for its rebuilding. And this danger appeared to them to be very great, and the vastness of the undertaking to be such as could hardly be accomplished. But while they were in this disposition, the king encouraged them and told them he would not pull down their temple till all things were gotten ready for building it up entirely again. And as he promised them this beforehand, so he did not break his word with them, but got ready a thousand wagons that were to bring stones for the building, and chose out ten thousand of the most skillful workmen, and bought a thousand sacerdotal garments for as many of the priests, and had some of them taught the arts of stone-cutters and others of carpenters, and then began to build. But this not till everything was well prepared for the work. So Herod took away the old foundations and laid others, and erected the temple upon them, being in length a hundred cubits, and in height twenty additional cubits, which twenty, upon the sinking of their foundations, fell down, and this part it was that we resolved to raise again in the days of Nero. Now the temple was built of stones that were white and strong, and each of their length was twenty-five cubits. Their height was eight, and their breadth about twelve, and the whole structure, as also the structure of the royal cloister, was on each side much lower. But the middle was much higher, till they were visible to those that dwelt in the country for a great many furlongs. 
but chiefly to such as lived over against them and those that approached to them. The temple had doors also at the entrance and lintels over them of the same height with the temple itself. They were adorned with embroidered veils, with their flowers of purple and pillars interwoven, and over these, but under the crown work, was spread out a golden vine with its branches hanging down from a great height, the largeness and fine workmanship of which was a surprising sight to the spectators, to see what vast materials there were, and with what great skill the workmanship was done. He also encompassed the entire temple with very large cloisters, contriving them to be in a due proportion thereto, he laid out larger sums of money upon them than had been done before him, till it seemed that no one else had so greatly adorned the temple as he had done. There was a large wall to both the cloisters, which wall was itself the most prodigious work that was ever heard of by man. The hill was a rocky ascent that declined by degrees towards the east parts of the city, till it came to an elevated level. This hill it was which Solomon, who was the first of our kings by divine revelation, encompassed with a wall. It was of excellent workmanship upwards and round the top of it. He also built a wall below, beginning at the bottom, which was encompassed by a deep valley and at the south side he laid rocks together and bound them one to another with lead, and included some of the inner parts, till it proceeded to a great height, and till both the largeness of the square edifice and its altitude were immense, and till the vastness of the stones in the front were plainly visible on the outside yet so that the inward parts were fastened together with iron and preserved the joints immovable for all future times. When this work for the foundation was done in this manner and joined together as part of the hill itself to the very top of it, he wrought it all into one outward surface and filled up the hollow places which were about the wall and made it a level on the external upper surface, and a smooth level also. This hill was walled all round, and in compass four furlongs, the distance of each angle containing in length a furlong. But within this wall, and on the very top of all, there ran another wall of stone also, having on the east quarter a double cloister of the same length with the wall, in the midst of which was the temple itself. This cloister looked to the gates of the temple, and it had been adorned by many kings in former times, and round about the entire temple were fixed the spoils taken from barbarous nations. All these had been dedicated to the temple by Herod, with the addition of those he had taken from the Arabians. Now on the north side of the temple was built a citadel whose walls were square and strong and of extraordinary firmness. This citadel was built by the kings of the Asamonian race, who were also high priests before Herod, and they called it the tower, in which were reposited the vestments of the high priests, which the high priests only put on at the time when he was to offer sacrifice. These vestments King Herod kept in that place, and after his death they were under the power of the Romans until the time of Tiberius Caesar, under whose reign Vitellius, the president of Syria, when he once came to Jerusalem, and had been most magnificently received by the multitude, he had a mind to make them some requital for the kindness they had shewn him, so, upon their petition, to have these holy vestments in their own power, he rode about them to Tiberius Caesar, who granted his request. 
and this, their power over the sacerdotal vestments, continued with the Jews till the death of King Agrippa. But after that, Cassius Longinus, who was president of Syria, and Cuspius Fadus, who was procurator of Judea, enjoined the Jews to reposit these vestments in the tower of Antonia, for that they ought to have them in their power, as they formerly had. However, the Jews sent ambassadors to Claudius Caesar to intercede with him for them, upon whose coming King Agrippa, Jr., being then in Rome, asked for and obtained the power over them from the emperor, who gave command to Vitellius, who was then commander in Syria, to give it them accordingly. Before that time, they were kept under the seal of the high priest and of the treasurers of the temple, which treasurers the day before a festival went up to the Roman captain of the temple guards and viewed their own seal and received the vestments. And again, when the festival was over, they brought it to the same place and showed the captain of the temple guards their seal, which corresponded with his seal, and reposited them there. And that these things were so, the afflictions that happened to us afterwards about them are sufficient evidence. But for the tower itself, when Herod the king of the Jews had fortified it more firmly than before, in order to secure and guard the temple, he gratified Antonius, who was his friend, and the Roman ruler, and then gave it the name of the Tower of Antonia. Now in the western quarters of the enclosure of the temple, there were four gates. The first led to the king's palace and went to a passage over the intermediate valley. Two more led to the suburbs of the city, and the last led to the other city, where the road descended down into the valley by a great number of steps and thence up again by the ascent for the city lay over against the temple in the manner of a theater, and was encompassed with a deep valley along the entire south quarter. But the fourth front of the temple, which was southward, had indeed itself gates in its middle, as also it had the royal cloisters, with three walks, which reached in length from the east valley unto that on the west, for it was impossible it should reach any farther. And this cloister deserves to be mentioned better than any other under the sun, for while the valley was very deep, and its bottom could not be seen, if you looked from above into the depth, this further vastly high elevation of the cloister stood upon that height, insomuch that if any one looked down from the top of the battlements, or down both those altitudes, he would be giddy, while his sight could not reach to such an immense depth. This cloister had pillars that stood in four rows, one over against the other all along, for the fourth row was interwoven into the wall, which also was built of stone, and the thickness of each pillar was such that three men might, with their arms extended, fathom it round, and join their hands again while its length was twenty-seven feet. With a double spiral at its base, and the number of all the pillars in that court was a hundred and sixty-two. Their chapitures were made with sculptures after the Corinthian order, and caused an amazement to the spectators by reason of the grandeur of the whole. These four rows of pillars included three intervals for walking in the middle of this cloister, two of which walks were made parallel to each other and were contrived after the same manner. The breadth of each of them was thirty feet, the length was a furlong, and the height fifty feet. 
but the breadth of the middle part of the cloister was one and a half of the other, and the height was double, for it was much higher than those on each side. But the roofs were adorned with deep sculptures in wood, representing many sorts of figures. The middle was much higher than the rest, and the wall of the front was adorned with beams resting upon pillars that were interwoven into it, and that front was all of polished stone, insomuch that its fineness, to such as had not seen it, was incredible, and to such as had seen it, was greatly amazing. This was the first enclosure, in the midst of which, and not far from it, was the second, to be gone up to by a few steps. This was encompassed by a stone wall for a partition, with an inscription which forbade any foreigner to go in under pain of death. Now this inner enclosure had on its southern and northern quarters three gates equally distant one from another, but at the east quarter, towards the sun rising, there was one large gate, through which such as were pure came in, together with their wives, but the temple further inward in that gate was not allowed to the women, but still more inward was there a third court of the temple, wherein too it was not lawful for any but the priests alone to enter. The temple itself was within this, and before that temple was the altar, upon which we offer our sacrifices and burnt offerings to God. Into none of these three did King Herod enter, for he was forbidden because he was not a priest. However, he took care of the cloisters and the outer enclosures, and these he built in eight years. But the temple itself was built by the priests in a year and six months, upon which all the people were full of joy, and presently they returned thanks, in the first place to God, and in the next place for the alacrity the king had showed. They feasted and celebrated this rebuilding of the temple, and for the king he sacrificed three hundred oxen to God, as did the rest, every one according to his ability, the number of which sacrifices is not possible to set down, for it cannot be that we should truly relate it. For at the same time with this celebration for the work about the temple fell also the day of the king's inauguration, which he kept of an old custom as a festival, and it now coincided with the other which coincidence of them both made the festival most illustrious. There was also an occult passage built for the king. It led from Antonia to the inner temple, at its eastern gate, over which he also erected for himself a tower, that he might have the opportunity of a subterraneous ascent to the temple, in order to guard against any sedition which might be made by the people against their kings. It is also reported that during the time that the temple was building, it did not rain in the daytime, but that the showers fell in the nights, so that the work was not hindered. And this our fathers have delivered to us, for it is incredible if any one have regard to the manifestations of God, and thus was performed the work of the rebuilding of the temple. End of Book 15 Chapters 10 and 11 End of Book 15 End of The Antiquities of the Jews, Volume 3 By Flavius Josephus Translated by William Whiston. Recording by Bill Mosley, Prelsburg, Texas, USA.